Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Tony. I'm an alcoholic. You going to make it? All right. Well, thanks for asking me to speak tonight. Um, you know, for for recovery last year was the first time I had been. I think it was the first conference I had been to since I had gotten sober. And since then, I've been to I don't know three or four since then in um, various places. And um, you know, I always get such a charge from these conferences. I always like hearing new speakers and new perspectives and meeting new people and. It kind of just gives me that jolt of recovery that I walk out and I'm like, I don't have to go to a meeting for like a week now. But um, no, it really spiritually charges me and I always I always enjoy it. So um, I'm glad to be up here setting the tone for this weekend. Um, No, I'm just kidding. Uh, um, So a little bit about me. My sobriety date is January 18th, 2012. Um, I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor. Um, She has a sponsor. I know she, and I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, And my home group, I have a home group. Um, It's the Monday Night Gay and Lesbian Mini Lead and Friends Meeting. It meets on Monday nights at 730 at All Saints Church in Indianapolis. Um, So come visit if you haven't been before. It's a great meeting. And I'm the secretary, so I should know. Um, I'm from Indianapolis, born and raised. Um... I grew up on the South Side. I'm one of six kids um, from a wonderful family. My parents have been together since they were 12. I've never seen them fight. Um, my parents were the furthest thing from alcoholics. So when I started drinking, it was like, I ran out of excuses pretty quickly because I pretty much had nothing to drink over. I had a really good childhood, the nothing I needed to complain about. Um, but you know, when I first got sober, I, I went the treatment route first. Um, and in treatment was where I first heard about this being a thinking disease. And, um, and you know, that really rang true for me because I can remember from a very early age feeling like my thinking just wasn't like everybody else's. Um, and that, you know, that's kind of a common thread that I hear a lot, which when I came to AA, that's how I knew I belonged because other people said a lot of things that I had thought was the only one that felt them over the years. But, um, I can remember one instance when I was about three years old and I was inside watching Sesame Street, I think, in my house and my parents were washing the car in the driveway and my little brother or my brother and sister were outside too. And my brother apparently decided to throw the car into gear and run over my mom's ankle. And, um, and so I was oblivious to all this. I was inside and my dad, she was pregnant with my younger sister at the time. And so my dad, you know, put her in the car and called the neighbor and said, take care of the kids. We got to take her to the hospital. And so, you know, I'm sitting inside and I remember, you know, I'm only three, so it's kind of like flashes of memory, but I remember thinking, you know, where is everybody? Something's wrong. And I go to the door and I look out the door and I see my parents driving away and I see my neighbor walking with my brother and sister down the street. And, you know, my first thought is everybody left me. Did they all forget about me? And, so I run up to my neighbor, and I don't remember exactly what he said, but I remember he told me what had happened. And I remember thinking, um, okay, I get it, but what if I hadn't come outside? What did, was, did everybody not notice I was around? Did you all forget about me? Um, but even then, I can, I can remember knowing that I couldn't say that because that was something wrong. There was something not right about that, so I couldn't say that out loud. Um, And, you know, I didn't know what that was until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was, you know, self-centered fear, and that's pretty much how I lived my whole life. I mean, I I went through life always being in fear about how something was going to affect me. Um, And, you know, I it it blocked me from a lot of things through my life Um, before I even touched alcohol. um, I kind of just went through life. And, you know, kept up this little bubble around me so I wouldn't get hurt. Um, I can remember I I didn't feel um, all that different from other kids until I went to school. 
And when I got to school, I immediately I was like, these people are not like me. I don't know where they came from, but they're way different than I am. Um, and part of that was, you know, I'm a gay man, and I didn't know what that was when I was that young, um, but I did feel that difference with the other boys. Um, I didn't like any of those sports that they liked. Um, I wasn't good at them either, so... Um, but you know, I just, I just always felt different and I never had any friends growing up. Um, you know, I never even tried to have any friends cause I was always afraid of that rejection. always afraid that, you know, they wouldn't want to be my friend. And, um, but you know, when, when I got into high school, I, you know, the promises say that God does for us what we can't do for ourselves. And, you know, I think he was really taking care of me through a lot of that because, all the friendships that I did develop, um, they just kind of happened. I didn't do anything. I just fell into them because, and I can remember being a sophomore in high school, and, you know, when I got to high school, I was like, oh, it's a fresh start. You know, none of these kids know me. I can finally be friends with all the popular people because they're the best. Um, but, you know, I wasn't going to go out of my way to try that because then I would get rejected. So I kind of just hung out on the fringes and, like, noticed what they said and, you know, would try and say things that I knew that they liked, but they didn't know that I knew that they liked that. I, you know, all this crazy manipulation in my head. Um, and it didn't work. Um, you know, they didn't really pay any attention to me. And and um, I remember thinking, you know, there's this group of friends that I have, and they seem to like me. So maybe I should, you know, they, they call me to do stuff, and maybe I should start hanging out with them. Um, and they happen to be the, you know, the smart goody two-shoes crowd. They're all smarter than me. Um, and so if I had fallen into a party crowd, I just would have started drinking that much sooner. Um, that's all that was really. Um, but yeah, I, I, I believe that God took care of me from a very early age when I really didn't know how to take care of myself and I didn't know how to ask for help to take care of myself. Uh, I just kind of kept it all up in here. You know, for a long time, I, I wore a lot of masks. Um, I was the funny guy because if everything was funny, even the most serious stuff, then you couldn't see what was really going on in here. And um, I was always the one to try and help everybody out. Um, I was the one that people came to for advice. Because if I'm helping you, then I don't have to help myself. Um, and so I always covered up my problems that way. And, um, and you know, once I started drinking, it was really easy not to have to worry about all that stuff going on inside of here. It was um, just kind of a mind number. First time I took a drink, I was 17. I studied abroad in France one summer between my junior and senior year of high school. And the family I stayed with, they liked to entertain a lot. So they had this little party, and they poured me a glass of champagne. And I didn't know that you're supposed to sip it. Um, I don't know if anybody in here sipped it, but I would venture to say probably not. But I did not. So I just drank it, you know, all in one you know, it was, it's only this big. Um, and so they thought that was hilarious. So they filled it up and I drank it again. And they just kept doing that and just were laughing hysterically. And I, I why is this so funny? I don't know. Um, so I had like six glasses of champagne and I don't know, 45 minutes. And um, it felt really good. I couldn't feel anything. So that, that was just pure elation. Um, but again, I knew that there was something broken about that. I couldn't you know, sit there and jump up and down and say, this feels great, because that didn't seem, nobody else was doing that, for one, and it didn't seem right to do that. And I remember going to the bathroom and just, like, looking in the mirror all giddy to myself, like, this feels great. Um, and I remember going, that same summer, I went to um, this dance club with some of the other people in my program, and I'd had a few drinks, and I was on the dance floor, and I remember thinking, like, you know, I'm a million miles away from home, a million miles away from real life, to be honest. And I was just like, God, I just want to stay in this moment right now because this, you know, I don't have to worry about anything else that's going on. I can just be whoever I want right here. Um, and I just wanted to stay there. And it's kind of funny that I said I could be whoever I wanted because I didn't, I still didn't know who I was. I didn't know, even know what I wanted to be. Um, so I, you know, had like a, temporary geographical cure, I guess you could say. And I knew when I went back that it was illegal to do that back home. And, you know, I had a fear of getting in trouble. So I, I wasn't ready to, I didn't want to do that yet. And none of my friends drank. So 
I wasn't going to be the one to start. Um, when I got to college, though, that's where I learned how to drink. And that's where I learned that when I when I drank, all the insecurities I felt when I was around all these other people, um, you know, it just it calmed them down. You know, I always I don't hear voices, but I always have a lot of chatter going on in my head. And when I drink, that chatter just kind of goes away a little bit. And and for a while it, that worked. For a while, that really worked, and that was the solution to my problem. Um, but that while doesn't last very long for people like us. Um, when I was 21, I came out. Um, I didn't really plan on it. It was through a different set of circumstances that I won't get into details about, but um, it involved alcohol and my big mouth. Imagine that. Um, but, you know, I really wasn't ready for it. I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how I felt about it because I didn't know how to feel about anything. And it was almost like this was like the last secret I was holding on to and the last mask that I had. So once that was off, I felt like completely exposed and that everyone was looking at me and I didn't know how to deal with that kind of stuff. And so I, the only thing I knew how to do was just to drink more. And so that's what I did. Um, and it started to not be fun anymore. I would drink and get depressed and call anyone that I that would answer the phone to cry to. Um, and one night, you know, I was 20, I think I was 22 by this time when you're, when you're young and you're drunk, your impulsivity is even higher. Um, and I remember sitting there one night just, and I just said, I don't even want to live anymore. And before I could even get the thought out of my head, I had already swallowed a bottle of pills I had in my room. Um, and, you know, I sat there for a few minutes. And then, again, God stepped in, doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And it was like this moment of clarity. And I, I said, I, no, I'm not, I'm not done. I'm not ready yet. I, I don't, I don't want to go. I don't know what to do, but I don't want to die. Um, and this was my roommate and I were having a party. So I was in the back bedroom. So, of course, I made myself the center of attention that night. Um, and I went to the hospital. My parents threw me into therapy. And the first thing this therapist said was, I think you have a drinking problem. And I was like, I'm 22. I drink just like every other 22-year-old that I know. You know, how can you expect me to quit drinking at 22? That's just, I could not even fathom that. Um, but I knew. I was like, uh, I, I wasn't convinced that I was an alcoholic. Um, I didn't think I had a permanent problem with it, but, um, you know, I knew it was a temporary issue, but I wasn't ready to say, I'm going to try and give it up because I didn't want to fail at that. And so I just told her, we're not going to talk about that. That's no, non-issue. Um, she respected that. And I saw her for about a year and a half and, um, I didn't realize it till I got here, but she was pretty much leading me through the steps. Um, yeah, very cunning. Um, and you know, it was kind of a band aid. Going to see a therapist for me was kind of a band-aid through all that. But I didn't tell her um, about all the things I did when I was drinking. You know, I would go in and see her and tell her everything else except all the consequences I was having. I didn't tell her about how I tried to drive from Lafayette down to Indianapolis and ended up almost in Illinois um, in a blackout. Don't remember how I got in the car, why I got in the car, where I was trying to go. Um, and I didn't tell her about... The time I fell asleep and I hit a curb and my airbags went off and I drove home anyway. <laughs> um, you know, things like that just happen to me all the time. Um, but you know, when I did do that thing where I apparently was trying to drive to Illinois, um, that was the first time I was like, maybe I have a problem. And I called my cousin who was in the program at the time and she had about two years sober and talked to her for a little bit. And hung up the phone was like, yeah, I don't think I want any part of that. Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't ready. I, I hadn't accepted the fact that I was an alcoholic. I just thought that maybe I needed to slow down. Um, maybe I needed to take a break. And I did. I didn't drink for about three months. And I told myself I would start drinking when or if I ever felt comfortable with it. Um, and so, you know, one night I was like, all right, I'm okay with it. And so I started again. And you know, things were okay for several years, actually. Um, and the longer things were okay, the longer I became convinced that alcohol was not a problem for me. Um, 
when I was 28, um, this was, I don't know, six or seven years after that, um, I had gastric bypass surgery. I had always been a heavy kid, like fourth grade, I don't know, this tall, 200, 215 pounds, something like that. Um, the pants I'm wearing now, this was the size I think I was wearing when I was 12, 11, something like that. Um, so I'd always been a big kid. And, you know, when I decided to do this, you know, of course I said it was for my health. And of course I said it was, you know, for all of these smart reasons to do it. Um, but really I was like, I want people to notice me and I want to look good for people. And I thought that's what it was all about. I thought that's all people saw when they looked at me. Um, and so that was, that was my main objective. I didn't, I didn't care if I was healthy or not. Um, and so I had that done, and they tell you not to drink for a year after you have that at least because your tolerance changes. Um, they say you're a lightweight and all this stuff, and I was like, I got that, whatever. Um, I waited two months, and I remember I was getting ready to go to Chicago for Memorial Day weekend, and I was like, well, I need to test it out and make sure that you know it's going to be okay if I drink. So... Beer had too much carbonation and would fill me up too fast. I figured I probably shouldn't start with liquor. Um, so I, I got a bottle of wine, and I remember I poured like a half a glass, and I just kind of sipped it and just waited like to see if my stomach imploded or something, and and nothing happened. Um, and, you know, it, it was like I had never stopped drinking before. Nothing happened at first. Um, in fact, I even thought at one point over, it was, you know, within a month, um, I thought, wow, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to get drunk again. Cause I was trying and for some reason my body was just not responding to it. Um, but you know, in the book we talk about that psychic change and I had, you know, a psychic change as well as a physical change with that because almost as soon as I thought, yeah, I got this, this is good. Um, I had lost by this time, like a hundred pounds over about three months. Um, and, um, you know, People definitely noticed me because I went out and made myself be noticed. Um, and alcohol was starting to help with that. So I got all these new friends and all these people that I went out with. And um, and then I just start, you know, and I, I didn't know what to do with all that attention either. I mean, and again, I don't know how much of it was in my head and how much of it was actually real. Um, but all I knew how to do to deal with anything good or bad was just to keep drinking um, but yeah, my body definitely couldn't handle it like it could before. Um, but I also could never stop at just one, no matter how much I told myself I was going to. Um, and I couldn't take much more of that at first. So, you know, within five months after I had surgery, um, I got arrested for the first time. Um, and it was, I fell asleep in a White Castle drive through Um, <laughs> It was, I don't remember it, but I got apparently somewhere between the speaker and the window. Um, I just came to on the curb in handcuffs and I saw my car and kind of figured out what happened. Um, but even then I thought, oh, it was this antidepressant I had just started. That's, it made me drink more and didn't even, you know, I'm sitting there in jail, not even thinking maybe I have a problem. No, I was just like, no, just a bad night. And I got caught. Um, and so after that, I just went to any lengths not to drive. I thought I just can't drive after I've been drinking. And my friends were very helpful. They would um, help me hide my keys. So I went and try and find them later and um, different things like that. Um, but, you know, it was less than a year later and I was right back in that jail again. Um, and this time, this time it was different. Um, I got it. I fell asleep again um, at a stoplight, though, outside my neighborhood. Um, and somebody apparently called the cops and said there's this car that's been sitting there for a while. Because um, they said that it was, I think they, the guy that called said he, I had sat through four or five light cycles. Um, and, you know, when I when I came to and I saw cop lights behind me, and I and I remember thinking, like, oh, my gosh, not again. This cannot be happening again. And I looked and saw where I was, and I'm like, and I am, like, seriously two minutes from my house. And out of instinct, I called my parents. Um and said, maybe if you come over here, they'll release me to you, because they do that for 30-year-old grown men. And, <laughs> and they came. I don't know why my parents came, but they came. Um, you know, again, I grew up in a very loving household, and my parents, I guess, 
just would do anything. Um, they might need your program. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so my parents came and they, um, they did not release me to them. So my parents got to watch me do the field sobriety tests, got to watch me do the breathalyzer, got to watch me try and talk my way out of it by throwing out the name of every cop I'd ever, I'd ever met. Um, which only made them even more mad. Um, the only saving grace was that they let my parents take my car home instead of impounding it. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has ever done this. Um, and you know, I shared details like this because when I first got here, I didn't know if I fit in and it wasn't until I heard details about people's stories that I realized that I fit in. Um, but when I was driving home, the part I do remember, I remember thinking that I had to pee so bad and I remember thinking I'm so close to home and I was like, I can't make it. So I'm like, I'll just go and clean it up when I get home. Um, well, I didn't make it home. And so right before the cop closed the squad car door, um, he, my dad was getting into my car and he said, Oh, by the way, your son had an accident on the seat. So I know he's your son, but it's still a biohazard. You might want to be careful of that. That's not a good last thing to hear right before you get taken to jail. And then on the way there, I realized it was Father's Day. Um, so I remember sitting in that jail cell, and that's the first time I ever prayed. And I said, God, if you get me through this, I promise I will stop drinking. I promise. And I, I meant it. That's, that's the scary part about this disease is that I really meant that. Um, and I was determined to. I don't know how I was going to do it, but I was like, I am never going to drink again. And the other part that was scary about that is, you know, I recognized the jailers that were in there because it hadn't been that long since I'd been there. Um, and it was easier. And that scared me to death. Going through a night in jail, getting processed, all that. I knew what to expect. So it was easier. I'm like, now I kind of get how people get three, four, five of these things. And, um, don't stop. I didn't understand that before. And that scared me because I'm like, no, I can't make this a habit. There's no way. Um, so I got out and I, I, and I didn't drink for, um, two weeks and you know, I, I didn't, I didn't have a solution. You know, I couldn't just stay dry. Um, you know, there was a speaker I heard a few weeks ago at a conference and he said that I can find the most trivial reason to take a drink. And the crazy thing is, is that it's not some alcoholic demon in my head trying to convince me. It's my own voice. It's my actual voice telling me that I need to take a drink. Um, I will say that he added that it's like the call coming from inside the house, which very much rings true. <laughs> um, and it's kind of funny. But yeah, that's, that's exactly how it was. It was like, you know, you can do this. You can just have one. You can just drink wine. You can just drink beer. You can just count how many beers you're going to drink an hour. And, you know, all of those crazy things that we do. Um, and so when I started drinking again, that was the beginning of the end, really, for me. Um, and it, over the next three months, um, I had a guy that wanted to date me, despite the fact I had a suspended license and couldn't drive and had a DUI that I just got. And he said, oh, well, I've had two. Great. Let's have a party. Um <laughs> And, you know, he drove me around everywhere, but, you know, he very quickly learned that I was only good in public for so long um, before I started falling over off of bar stools and onto tables. And, um, and he, you know, so then it was like we would go out to dinner and drinks and more drinks and, um, you know, two hours started turning into 90 minutes, started turning into an hour. And I knew what he was doing. And I, so I just drank faster. And then I would think of every, I would just try and think of any way I could get him to stop at the store so that we could get more. Um, and I would pass out on the couch every night. Um, and I would wake up in the morning, sometimes drinking hands, sometimes on the floor. Um, and I would look at my phone and he would, he couldn't wake me up to put me to bed. So he would call my phone thinking that I would hear it or feel it. And, and I would have like 20 missed calls and they would be over the span of like 30 minutes. And that, that was a horrible feeling for me. Um, I just was, I, I mean, that just made me feel sick inside. But again, I, I, I just, I didn't think, you know, there was, um, I didn't think I had any way out. 
and you know, before, before I checked myself into treatment, um, I checked into treatment on a Sunday, Friday night, I bought two bottles of wine. I only drank one and went to bed. So I thought, Oh, I got this. All right. I'm good. And things like that would happen. And I would hold on to them forever. That's, that's why I can control my drinking. Cause I did it that one time. Um, and then the following night, total bender, um, blacked out. Don't remember. Came home with someone else's shirt. I don't know what happened to mine. Um, took a cab home. The cab driver threatened to call the police because I wouldn't stop falling asleep. Um, and I woke up and I'm like, oh, how did I do this again? I was so good last night. How did I do this again? Um, and those last three months, it was just like that up and down all the time. Um, and ironically, by this time I was allowed to drive to work and back. Um, so I thought I could drive to the Starbucks outside my neighborhood because it was a Sunday morning. Nobody's out. Um, and ironically, I was texting with a friend who I knew was in the program, like, maybe I'll come to one of your meetings and see what it's about. Um, missed a curve in the road in my neighborhood and totally took out a mailbox. Um, and, you know, all the things that I described that I've done, mailbox is pretty small compared to all that. But that that's what did it. Because I panicked and fled and hold myself up in my house lock the door, shut the blinds. Um, and I, you know, I was like, okay, you have this DUI you haven't taken care of. You're not supposed to be driving. I didn't know it at the time, but I was still drunk from the night before. Um, and I was like, what are you going to do if somebody saw you and the cops show up? Um, and you know, my instinct is not to deal with it, to check out. I'm like, well, okay, well, if I see a cop car, I'm finding every last pill in this house and I'm going to take it and just pray that it does the trick before they get inside. Um, and, you know, I'm outside pacing around my backyard. And it was October, so it was cold. Um, and I had on, like, sweats. But I was sweating a whole bunch. And I, I still remember that feeling. And I have to remember that feeling. So I remember how bad it felt when I was done. And um, so, you know, the cops didn't come. And... After I realized that they weren't coming, I, I, I was done. I said, I can't do this anymore. And I don't know how I need to help myself, but I need to get some help. And I remember just thinking in my head, I need to ask for help. I need to ask for help. And so I called my sister. She took me to treatment and I checked in. Um, two things happened once I got to treatment that day that kind of said, okay, I think you did the right thing. When they took my blood alcohol at 3 p.m., so it had been probably 12 hours since I had a drink and I blew a 0.08. And to me, I did not expect that. I was expecting it to say zero. So I started thinking, you know, every night for at least the last 90 days, um, you know, I drank until I passed out. So I was going to work drunk. And there was maybe a couple hours out of every day, probably, that I wasn't intoxicated. I'm like, okay, you're an alcoholic. You know, I always thought an alcoholic was a guy that sat under a bridge drinking, you know, something out of a paper bag. I was that guy, but my bridge was my house and that paper bag was my hand. And, you know, that was, I was like, oh, wow, I can't believe it. You know, I'm a daily drinker. I drink every day. That was a realization for me. Um, they took us that night to a cocaine anonymous meeting. And I was like, I have never done cocaine. I don't know what that is. Um, it wasn't until I got to AA that I found out what an eight ball was. Um, and, but the guy that was sharing all the feelings that he had after he used, um, I mean, it was like looking in a mirror and I was like, okay, I think I am one of these addicts or whatever. Um, so recovery was, or recovery treatment was good for me. Um, like I said, that was where I first learned about it being a thinking disease, about it being a disease at all. They taught us about like the physiological and biological aspects um, of the disease. And, you know, I felt like a, a big failure and I had a lot of shame going into treatment that, you know, I didn't I wasn't able to defeat this on my own. And um, hearing a lot of that helped me relieve me of that shame. Um, and I, I needed to hear that because I thought it was my fault. And I thought that I just didn't try hard enough. And, you know, all those things that we tell ourselves Um and I knew when I got out of there that if I didn't start a program the day I got out, I wouldn't start at all. So I got out at 3 p.m. and I went to my first meeting that night. 
It's my home group now. Um, and you know, I, I started out, I did 90 meetings in 90 days or more. Um, that whole concept of never drinking again was kind of always what held me back because I just couldn't wrap my head around that. And so they told me not to drink one day at a time and they told me what that means. And, and I could get that. I could do that. Um, you know, sometimes it was even shorter than that. I just had to make it from work to a meeting without a drink. Sometimes I just had to make it from a meeting to home and then home to my bed and just not have a drink. Um, and I had to break it down like that. Um, you know, that first weekend I was sober, I remember I had a lot of fear because that was, you know, I wasn't going to have work during the day. And that was a lot of times when I drank was on the weekends. I would just go on benders. And um, so I, you know, that's when I did like two or three meetings in a day. Um, and I just had to break it down. I just got to get to this meeting and then I got to talk to this person and go see this person. And, um, I heard very early on that alcohol doesn't hit a moving target. And so I just got busy. Um, and I tried to fill my day up with anything recovery related. Um, because I, I'm still scared to take a drink. Um, but I was really scared of drinking then. Um, cause I didn't know what would happen when I took, uh, when I took even just one, cause it never was just one. Um, so I started doing that, started working the steps. I got into a workshop. Um, you know, the steps the first time around for me, you know, it was, um, you know, finding the higher power. I, I still believed in the God that I was raised with. That part was kind of easy. Um, but you know, I was, I was raised in a church. I went to Catholic school for 13 years. I have nothing against Catholics at all. So don't take that the wrong way. But, um, you know, I, I just was not, I didn't get any spirituality from that, but I found spirituality when I came to AA. Um, and I can still remember like those first six months or so, I would still go to church with my parents occasionally. And, the more and more I went, the more and more I became convinced that when I was there, it was just zapping my serenity and it was stealing my serenity from me. And, um, so I told my mom, I was like, I can't go to church with you anymore. I'm sorry. I, you know, I don't know if that's ever going to change, but I can't go with you. Um, and at the time I was comfortable with that decision. Um, it wasn't until I worked the steps the second time around, like 18 months later. Um, and there's that part, and I think it's in the 12 and 12, where they talk about being tolerant of other people's faiths. And I didn't remember reading that before. And, it, you know, it talked about just because it doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean it can't work for other people. And that that's okay. And, you know, you should accept that it works for them. And, and that's, you know, that's not an issue. And that was such an eye-opener for me. And once I accepted that part, um, the next time I went to church with my family... I didn't feel that serenity zapping, you know, I, I, I actually kind of liked it. Um, you know, so that it was like the, the first time I worked the steps, it was a lot of drunk behavior, a lot of behaviors I did when I was drunk, a lot of things I did when I was drunk. It was pretty easy to look at those and say, well, yeah, I was drunk. That's probably why. Um, it wasn't until I did the steps the second time around. I'm like, okay, I'm still doing this and I'm sober. <laughs> so now we need to look at this a little bit more. Um, and you know, the, the steps were very freeing for me. I, um, when I, uh, I started 12 stepping, like, I don't know, a month into the program. I don't know what it was, but it was, somebody called me the 12 step magnet because I would, you know, and in the gay community, a lot of people drink. It's just kind of, it's there. <laughs> um, and I knew a lot of people and, a lot of people, I guess, started seeing the change in me. And so they would, you know, say, maybe I should try that. And, it's like, all right, well, let's go to a meeting. And, um, a lot of them didn't stay, but, um, I remember I would get to a meeting. I'm like, okay, I'm taking you to this meeting, but I can't do anything with you after that. Cause I don't know what to do. You know, I'm not there yet. I'm only on step six. Um, and my sponsor said, you don't have to sponsor them, but if you got more clean time than they have, you can talk to them about your recovery. You can tell them how you've recovered so far. Um, and so I did that and I, and then, um, I started getting involved with the telephone answering service and, you know, and most of those calls are just people looking for meetings. Um, you know, they're not real intense, but you know, I, I, I started listening to Joe and Charlie tapes recently. Um, and you know, and it says right there in the big book too, about how it started with two alcoholics helping one another out. And, you know, they were the one, you know, Bill W was out of town and 
he got in touch with Dr. Bob through that church. And um, that's how it works, you know, just one talking to another. And that's, and, you know, at first I kind of did it out of obligation because um, I knew I was obligated to do it. Now I actually, I enjoy it. I enjoy helping someone else. I enjoy giving that back to someone. Um, you know, I, I, I have one sponsee um, that calls me and um, working with her, you know, I knew at first when I said, yeah, I will, that it was my obligation to do that. But working with her and seeing her grow has just been amazing. It is just, you know, I never expected to have that kind of reward in sobriety. Um, so a couple other, um, some other lessons I've learned since I've been sober. Um, when I was about three months sober, my 87-year-old grandma said that she wanted to go to London and Paris before she died. And we were like, well, you better get cracking. Um <laughs> 87. Can't wait too long. So because I had studied abroad there, my mom wanted me to go to and, you know, and I was like, I am three months sober. I have no money. What do you, I no, I can't go. And she said, well, just save up for the down payment. And then, you know, we'll worry about the rest later. And so I did that. And then it got to be like four or five months from the trip. And, um, you know, I was like, I, I do not have the rest of this money. You know, I, I'm trying to clean up, you know, the other financial wreckage of my past and all that. And, um, and so my mom, um, offered to give me the money. And, you know, I really struggled with accepting that as a gift. Um, but, you know, I talked to my sponsor and prayed about it and said, fine, I'll let you pay for the rest of my trip to Europe. Um, and, you know, I still had, um, we got on the plane. I remember my grandma said, am I crazy for doing this? And my mom said, well, it's too late now because we're on the plane. We're going. Um, but, you know, it, in that trip, I got to go to a meeting in Paris, which was amazing. You know, when you're in a strange foreign place and you walk into a room of Alcoholics Anonymous, you feel at home. At least I did. Um, and, you know, I'm like, wow, it's it's not any different over here than it is, you know, right down the street from my house. Um, no matter where I go, AA is AA. Um, and I remember my I was going to make amends to my mom where on this trip because I knew we'd have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. Um, and this was the day before we left and I hadn't done it yet. And the topic at this meeting I went to was about the ninth step. And this guy shared about making amends. I'm like, okay, I hear you. I get it. God, I'll do it. And so I did. And, um, and you know, it was, it was amazing. You know, my mom, um, I pretty much knew that what she was going to say, but I, it, you know, I knew it wasn't for her. It was for me. And I had to tell her you know, all the things I had done wrong. She actually stopped me. She's like, you don't have to do this to yourself. And I'm like, no, I do. I have to tell you, you know, what I did. And I know that you already know, but I have to tell you. Um, and it, it, it was, it was great. And, you know, I got to go to the Normandy beaches with my grandma and she got to tell me all those stories about people that she knew that fought in the war and stories I had never heard her even talk about before. Um, and you know, when I got back, I got, to, I got back on a sun on a Monday and Tuesday, I had my, my one year. Um, and that was just amazing. And, um, and you know, I was, again, it goes back to God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves because I was sitting there trying, you know, because of the money issue, I was like, no, I can't go. I can't go. And, and even when the opportunity presented myself to, you know, a solution to that, I still was like, no, I shouldn't do that. I can't go. And, and, you know, it was like, step out of the way. And I did. And that's the reward that I got. Um, and um, about six weeks after we got home, we lost my grandmother. Um, she died very peacefully in her sleep, um, watching TV with her little Catholic newspaper on her lap. Um, and and when I got the call from my mom that she had died, I was like, oh, now I know why I was supposed to go. Now I get it. Um, more will be revealed. Um, and you know, that time I got to spend with her, if I hadn't had that, I know I would have regretted it. Um, and I know I would have, you know, really kicked myself for not doing that. So sometimes I just got to step out of the way and got, let God do what he needs to do. Um, cause he has a, he has a better plan than I do. Um, I, I definitely know that. Um, shortly after that, um, I was a little over a year sober and, 
um, I had started to have a lot of back problems even before I got sober. Um, and so I, I was getting, starting to get prescribed prescription pain medication. Um, and I know this is an AA meeting, but, um, I didn't know it at the time. Um, I found out later that, um, you know, I didn't think that it would be a problem for me to take prescription drugs that were mind altering. And I didn't think that I had to really tell my doctor that I was in recovery. And I, you know, none of this stuff, um, no, it dawned on me. I won't say that. It definitely dawned on me. I didn't think I had to, I didn't think I had to talk about it. Um, cause it wasn't alcohol and I never had a problem with those before when I drank. Um, I never even took them. Um, and you know, they're, they're prescribed They're It's okay. And you know, I'm not, it's nothing illegal. Da 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 da. All these excuses, but you know, it didn't take too long before I was doing all of that, um, irrationalization with, with taking pills. Um, you know, I know I'm not supposed to take one for two more hours, but I feel pain, you know, or I'm not feeling any effect from it. I don't think it's working. I need to take another one or two or three. And, um, and that the whole cycle just started all over. Um, but in my head, I was like, I can't tell anyone because I don't know one they'll you know of course i'm convinced that they'll reject me they will kick me out of aa um despite all the people i'd already seen come in and out by that point um and you know i just kept saying i'll just i'll just you know once this prescription is finished I'll, i won't do it anymore and i'll be fine um and this went on for like 3 months and i still went to meetings um i still talked to my sponsor um i gave a lead once i wasn't high but i wasn't sober um and and I remember there was like six weeks between these prescriptions because I, you know, ran out early, of course. And right before I got the last one, I was on my way to the doctor and I said, OK, I'm going to tell her I'm going to be straight with her and, you know, we'll figure this out together. And I walk in and what comes out of my mouth is that I need more. And and she gave me more. Um, I think I mentioned to her once that I was in recovery. And I remember when I mentioned it, I was like, I don't think she heard me. <laughs> but I didn't say it again. Um, and so that last time that I, that I did that, um, I took 180 pills in about seven days. Um, and, and the insanity part of this is that two or three days before they were finished, I remember I took like a whole bunch over like a three or four hour time span. Cause I just wanted them to be gone because I knew I was like, this is it. I can't do this anymore after this, after this, I'm actually going to tell somebody I have to, um, and, you know, it didn't dawn on me. I could just flush them down the toilet. That's the insane part is that, you know, I can't let them go to waste. I have to take them. Um, but, you know, even a after I finished them, a couple days, I started to feel okay. I wasn't withdrawing as much. And I'm like, uh, maybe I don't have to tell anybody. But um, someone I had recently befriended went back out. And I remember texting him and saying that, you know, you got to get honest. You got to come back. That's how this works. And click, <laughs> you know, I was like, I got to tell this to myself. Um, I heard somebody say in a lead a few months ago that when you go out and you decide you want to come back, even for a second, come back in that second. And that's exactly what I did. I called my sponsor and I said, I know we're as sick as our secrets and I'm so scared to death that you're going to hate me, but I have to tell you this. And, and he said, you'll be fine. We'll get you through it. It's all right. Um, and so I, and the meeting I went to that night where I took a start over chip, um, it just happened to be that all my closest friends in AA were there. Um, you know, that's, that's God doing for me what I can't do for myself. Um, and they, they did not treat me any differently. They didn't kick me out. They didn't say they hated me. They didn't reject me. All those fears that I had are just up here. Um, and so I started over and starting over is hard. Oh my gosh. So hard. Um, and you know, I know it's not a requirement. Um, but I have a lot more compassion for people that go in and out now because it's, it's not easy to come back. Um, it's not easy at all. And, and I remember, you know, a friend of mine said, do you really have to take a start over token? Cause you didn't drink. And I, you know, I wrestled with that even after I, I, I said, I'm not sober period. So I need to do that for me. And I talked to my sponsor and prayed about it. And, you know, we agreed. Um, but I still, you know, in the back of my head was like, you know, I, did I just give up that, that year and few months? 
that I had before and do I really need to do that? And then I found this wonderful pamphlet called AA and Other Medications I had never seen before. And it was like, oh, if only I had read this maybe eight months ago. Maybe things would have been differently, but that's okay. It just wasn't meant to be that way. But after I read through that and read some more about Alcoholics Anonymous stance on other medications, I knew that I did the right thing. And I knew that it was the right decision. Um, and I knew how to be an advocate for myself with my health. And that when a doctor suggests, like, oh, we can write you a script for this, I can say, no, I'm in recovery, and I, I can walk, so I don't need these. Um, that's okay. And, you know, since then, I've had two back surgeries, um, and during both of those, I had a plan. I stayed with my parents. I, my mom held my pills, you know, so because if I, I, if I have control over those, all bets are off. I, I, can't, con I can't control it, and that's just the way it is. Um, so even when I have actually needed them, I have a solution now on how to deal with that. Um, because I have to take care of myself. I mean, that's part of my recovery too. Um, so let's see what else was I going to talk about? Um, you know, something I've learned a few other lessons recently. Um, you know, I've, I've been sober now a year and a half. I've been coming around the program for about three years. And for some reason, when I came in, I thought that, you know, because I stopped drinking, everything was going to be fixed. I was going to be rich and I was going to um, be rich. And I, was, I mean, yeah, you know, I just thought that I was just going to everything was going to turn around, you know, um, and it didn't it it doesn't happen that way. I have to really work at it. Um, and for, you know, probably a few months ago for a while, I was getting really stuck feeling I was stuck and that things just weren't moving fast enough and no matter how much I prayed about it no matter how much I said you know I just got to keep chiseling it away it just wasn't getting any better and it was actually at the Circle City Roundup and it was Mickey I think that was talking and you know Mickey's got like 18 20 some years or something and um her and there was like two other speakers in the span of about a few weeks that I heard that all had you know like 20 years 15 10 plus years of sobriety um, and they talked about all these miracles that they had, but that it had taken a while to get to those. And it had taken a lot, or I guess I should say a long time of little bits of work. It's, you know, like I said, it was just that chiseling away. Um, and, you know, that's given me a lot of hope recently that, you know, 18 months or so is a long time to go without a drink or a drug. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it is not very much time at all. Um, and I am nowhere near recovered. And even accepting that, you know, acceptance is the answer to all my problems. It says right there in the big book. Um, and accepting that is is very much a relief for me. Because I know that I can, I just have to keep doing the next right thing. And I have to keep working the steps. And I have to keep, um, you know, doing everything that I've been taught to do. And, you know, some days are not as easy to do that. Um but I know that I can start my day over anytime too. The other day I, I, um, God, I remember because I've let most of it go already, but, oh, now I remember it was okay. There were like two accidents on the highway. Um, and I, I went like four miles and 45 minutes and I was late to work and, you know, then I get to work and realize I forgot my badge. And then, so I go to sign in and I go to get my ID and realize I forgot my wallet and I had to drive to Wisconsin that night for work. I mean, just, you know, a series of unfortunate events and it wasn't even you know 9 30 yet and it was like just start your day over just start your day over you can go home and get your wallet after work it's going to add 45 minutes to your drive but that's okay they're going to let you into work because they know who you are um you know i can make a mountain out of any molehill um but you know the the option that i have now is that i can just start my day over again and that's not a problem and something else even happened later that morning. I'm like, wow, I've had to start my day over twice in a very long time. Um, but, you know, I have that choice now. Um, having choices now is very freeing. Um, um, I'm going to tell one more, one more story and then I'll shut up. Oh, I said I would never say that because nobody ever shuts up when they say that. So I'm going to try and hold true to it. But... Um, so Labor Day weekend, I was in Palm Springs. I went to this conference um, of gay male sober alcoholics, addicts, what have you. There were like a thousand gay men there, all sober. 
um, which I thought was just amazing. Um, and you know, they had some really good workshops there. And, um, and I was reminded that week and I was with a bunch of my friends from here and some people I knew from other parts of the country that were there. And, um, I have this app on my phone that shows me like Facebook posts from one year ago today, two years, three years, four, five years. Um, and so sometimes I'll see stuff from my drinking days and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Um, but that weekend it show it popped up in these pictures from a camping trip I was on. And this camping trip was four years ago. And, um, and one night I was drunk and then I tried a couple different drugs. Um, and I don't think you're supposed to mix those, but I did because I was drunk and I, you know, more and more, more, um, it didn't feel any differently to me, but, um, but I, you know, in the middle of a blackout, I guess I fell and scraped my head on the pavement. And I remember when I went back to work the next week, I told everybody I tripped and fell into a tree stump and I'm sure nobody believed me either. But, um, but I remember I woke up the next morning and the guy I was sharing a tent with was like, what did you do to your face? And, um, so we found someone that had like makeup powder and put it on my face to try and hide it all. Um, and I had, hadn't looked in the mirror or anything. And then the next morning before we left, I finally took a shower. Um, and I remember looking in the mirror after I got out of the shower and I did not recognize the person I saw looking back at me. And I had all these strawberries like all over my face. Um, and it was like looking into a soulless person. Um, and it was horrible and I hated that feeling, but you know, I walked out like thinking that it was so funny and telling everybody, you know, look what I did, look at my battle wounds. And you know, everybody was joking with me about it and inside, you know, like I said, I had to play that funny guy because I don't want people to know what I'm really feeling inside. Um, and I remember seeing those pictures a few weeks ago and thinking like, wow, I can get up in the morning now and look in the mirror and I'm not scared to look in the mirror. And I actually like the person looking back at me. Um, that's a miracle. I don't have to wake up in the morning and wonder if my car is in the garage. I don't have to wake up and wonder if I put spoons in the freezer the night before to cover up my eye puffiness in the morning. I don't have to, you know, bandage myself basically anymore. I can get up and just walk into the world and say, here I am. And that's who I am. Um... So this program has definitely worked for me. Um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I continue to learn day after day something new, something more about myself, because the short time I have sober, I, I still don't know who, th who this is inside. Just when I think I know, something else happens that says, no, you don't. Um, and I, the good thing about that is I enjoy it now. When I think I know myself and then find out that I don't, I don't get discouraged that's a reward for me. Um, you know, I, I didn't have choices before and I have a lot of choices now. Um, and I said I was going to shut up, so I'm going to thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.